From the CISO series, it's Cybersecurity Headlines. Pegasus spyware confirmed on journalist phones. Federal agencies are failing to protect sensitive data, according to a Senate report, and ransomware operators recruiting insiders to breach corporate networks. These are some of the stories that my colleagues and I have been bringing to you this week on Cybersecurity Headlines. And now we get a chance for some insight, opinion, and definitely some expertise on these stories and more from our guest, Sandy Dunn, CISO at Blue Cross of Idaho. Sandy, welcome to the show. Great to have you here. Oh, hi, Rich. Great to be here. All right. And full disclosure here, uh, these are Sandy's opinions that we're going to be talking about on the show, not those of our employer. We also want to give a big shout out to our sponsor, PlexTrack. We'll be hearing more from them later on in the show. And remember, you can join us on Crowdcast. We'll have a URL up in the corner if uh, you want to be joining us on there to join in the conversation. We've got 20 minutes, so let's make the best of it. First up here, our first story of the day, remote print servers are give, uh, gives anyone with Windows admin privileges uh, on, or excuse me, <laughs> a remote print server gives anyone Windows admin privileges on a PC. So a researcher has created a remote print server that allows any Windows user with limited privileges to gain complete control over a device by installing a print driver. This follows a zero day Windows print spooler uh, inter- uh, vulnerability known as Print Nightmare. Microsoft released a security update for this new one, but researchers figured out ways to bypass the patch. This new method effectively allows anyone including threat actors, to get priv- uh, ad- administrative privileges simply by installing the remote print driver. Uh, not exactly a, a surprising story, I hear. I guess you've been seeing a lot of these print driver stories here, Sandy. Uh, is, this a, is this a major worry, concern uh, from your perspective? Well, Rich, you know, anytime, if it's connected to the network, it's a, it's a viable attack vector for an attacker. So, you know, and, and the fact that these IoT devices, I mean, you think about it, printers were our first IoT devices connected to, to the network. Um, the vulnerabilities in them have been around for a really long time. Um, I just dug out an old book, a favorite, um, how, to own a, how to Own a Network, and that was written in 2003, 18 years ago. And in that story, it talks about a hacker actually actually using a, a printer to share files. So we, we've known about these devices. We've known that they are a liability on our network. Um, you know, do a simple Google dork of printers in, in Google and you find all of these exposed printers. I mean, it, it just is evidence of the problem that we know we should know better, but we're still seeing that people aren't locking down their systems and, and really patching them. Yeah, there's all sorts of sturm and drang about, you know, uh, when are we going to, you know, solve IoT in the the enterprise or something like that from a security perspective. We've had printers for 40 years or more and <laughs> still have an issue. With right. them. So we we will see if if that goes here. Uh, you know, an interesting twist on this, but definitely uh, not a new security concern uh, from a lot of people's perspective. Our next story up here, uh, Iran leaks hints at second tier targets as next terror gateway. Sky News has exposed a trove of documents appearing to be from a branch of the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Court Intelligence Group 13, catchy name. They show a coordinated attempt to collect information on the vulnerabilities of second tier targets, including those that can capsize merchant vessels, remotely control electrical controllers in building management systems, and tamper with fuel pumps triggering spills or explosion. Pretty nasty stuff. Experts say this may indicate a shift to target more easily exploitable sites. So, you know, Sandy, my question to you is, uh, what does this say about the vulnerability of soft targets? You know, what can we what can we do about this kind of stuff? Kind of a, a, a new uh, a threat service to be worried about for sure. Well, I, I think, you know, and it's a recurring theme in, in the stories that we're looking at this week is, is, you know, everyone's in scope for an attack. If, if it does any kind of communication that is over wireless or over a network, you're in scope for to be attacked. So, um, you you need to have a team. You need to be looking at your attack surface and locking it down. I think the most interesting quote in the whole article was when um, he talked about you know using basic cybersecurity hygiene. You know the tools exist to prevent this. So use segmentation, password validation, two factor authentication. You know th- what I think the story is saying is these attackers are looking for people who aren't doing their cyber hygiene. 
Yeah. And, and kind of, you know, coasting along on, you know, this has never been a problem before. Why is it, you know, an, an issue now? I always, when these kind of stories come up, I always think of a lot of the concerns around things like SCADA systems, that kind of stuff where, oh, yeah. you know, they, these are all connected systems that control a lot of important stuff. And, and we're still kind of grappling with the security implications on that. Um, definitely when there's state sponsored uh, um, activity around there, definitely a concern to be had for sure. In other state-sponsored news, we have uh, Pegasus spyware confirmed on journalist phones. French intelligence investigators say Pegasus spyware has been found on the phones of three journalists, including a senior staff member at the country's international television station, France 24. This is significant because it's the first time an independent authority has corroborated the findings of Forbidden Stories, a Paris-based nonprofit media organization, and Amnesty International, who both had access to a list of numbers that were of interest to clients of the Israeli firm NSO Group, and then pass them on to uh, subsequently to media partners, getting that confirmation now, uh, kind of a, a big deal here. This all started with the French president, uh, Macron, uh, saying that he was on that list, obviously taking uh, more than a little exception to it. Not great, uh, but does anything about this stand out as particularly troubling from your perspective, Sandy? Uh, you know, uh, you know. again, any of these type of tools, um, you know, Pegasus, Finn Fisher, you know, any of these spyware tools, we're consistently seeing that we're being told that they're they're controlled, that they're only being used in uh, uh, to prevent, you know, cyber criminals, people who are doing drug trades, those kinds of things. And then the evidence is showing that that's not true, that these tools are being used to uh, restrict people and to attack journalists and human rights violations. And I, I think that uh, it's extremely troubling uh, that that um, we don't have a good mechanism in place to understand who's using these tools and why. Um, and I don't have a great answer for it, but I definitely believe that it's evidence, you know, at a at a national or at a global level that we need to have some rules of engagement in place. Yeah, and it really goes against prevailing kind of security wisdom at this point, where you know we've we've seen basically every major uh, tech company coming out with bug bounties, like 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 less ob obscurity, you know, more transparency with these kind of things. Whereas groups like NSO Group or, or other organizations like that thrive uh, when it comes to hey, let's stockpile all of these. Um, you know, that's that's what you know, APTs have been doing for years, obviously, but, you know, stockpiling this and kind of weaponizing them to sell as a commercial product, I think is definitely problematic at the scale that they can very easily reach, you know, whether NSO Group even knows it, you know, there's been speculation that they've been investigating, they've been investigating internally and now are receiving uh, uh, pressure from Israel to to further mount that up as to if and who is abusing their tools. Absolutely, Rich. I mean, the, the quote that I thought was interesting from the the one of the uh, founders was that, uh, you know, he was quoted as saying, somebody has to do the dirty work. You know, that doesn't, you know, that doesn't sound like someone who's really being accountable and responsible for the tool that he's sticking, you know, putting out into the world. You know, he's, he's justifying that, hey, yeah, that, you know, somebody's got to clean up the garbage. So, um, yeah, I, you know, definitely it raised concerns. And, and probably the, the most troubling thing about this whole story was the fact that, that what, the, one of the comptrollers reported that the NSO group was not being ethical and selling their product over a year ago, and the Israeli government didn't start investigating until this story came out. So they're getting information. They're, they're clearly not taking the, the abuse of this tool seriously. I also want to call out, you know, some of these tools um, were used against um, Ron Farrow when he was go doing an investigation against Harvey Weinstein. So if you have the money, you have access access to these tools and you know somebody's got to be somebody has to be in the middle of making those ethical decisions i mean they're they're too dangerous well speaking of in the middle someone's in the middle of military ship locations because there's been a report that people are spoofing them according to researchers since august 2020 over 100 warships from at least 14 european countries as well as russia and the us have had locations faked using the automatic identification system or ais these fake locations were often in disputed or into territorial waters of another country and lasted for up to days at a time. Part of the problem is that AIS is an unencrypted system, with some in the security community now calling for adding digital signatures to each AIS transmission. 
I, I, full disclosure, this is the plot of a Bond movie. Uh, it's like, <laughs> yeah. this is this is not, you know, this is <laughs> entering into the realm of almost science fiction here. Definitely has the same kind of dangerous feeling, dystopian almost, that we've seen from uh, deep fake kind of technology in terms of spoofing identity. Spoofing warships can be, uh, you know, certainly be equally as damaging, uh, even more so. Uh, what should the military, NATO be doing to educate countries about this type of smokescreen, Sandy? I, you know, I, I, again, I, you know, attacking communication, I mean, I mean, it goes clear back to World War One. I. I mean, you know, the the threat isn't new. If you if you're out, if you're doing stuff, if it if you're sending a signal, somebody's listening. Somebody's trying to get in the middle of, of it. They're capturing metadata. They may not even be trying to stop or getting, you know, trying to prevent you from communicating. But if, if it's out there and people can see it, they're using it. Um, to your point, Mark Goodman uh, wrote about the same type of attack in his book, Future Crimes. So I, I think what we're seeing in this in stories, you know, this week and almost every week is, is hey, it's time to do something about our this internet and all of this communication and and what are we doing to protect each other and our citizens and all of our families and, and things that um, we care about. All right, it's also time now to thank our sponsor, PlexTrack. We really appreciate their support of the show. PlexTrack is a powerful yet simple cybersecurity platform that centralizes all security assessments, pen test reports, audit findings, and vulnerabilities. PlexTrack transforms the risk management lifecycle, allowing security professionals to generate better reports faster, aggregate and visualize analytics, and collaborate on remediation in real time. Check out PlexTrack.com slash CISO series to learn why PlexTrack is the perfect platform for CISOs. All right. Next story, near and dear to my heart, involves pneumatic tubes. We have to worry about them. They're a security surface now. Uh, everything, uh, cats and dogs, lying together, et cetera, et cetera. A vulnerability called Pwned Piper is impacting the TransLogic pneumatic tube system, currently used in over 3,000 hospitals to move things like lab samples and medicine. An attacker on a hospital's internal network could effectively use the vulnerabilities to take over the entire tube network. TransLogic says a software update for all but one of the vulnerabilities has been developed with a mitigation technique available for the unpatched vulnerability. It was a little dubious in the reporting if they had actually started rolling out the patch or if it had just been developed. I believe it is now being rolled out. This definitely seems, though, to be a gap here in terms of like exploit and patch. We've certainly seen this uh, with Microsoft Exchange vulnerabilities. I mean, the list goes on and on and on about patch all the things. There are reasons sometimes we can't patch all the things. Given your line of work, though, Sandy, you know, even with comments, you know, just kind of for your own personal opinion, how can we help hospitals handle this and can hospitals handle this? Yeah, Rich, I just, when I saw this story, I just, my heart went out to every cybersecurity team that's working in a hospital. They have such a difficult task. Um, I've had the opportunity to meet with many of them. Um, they typically have less people. They have a bigger attack surface. They have the most, you know, the most unique devices. Uh, it just raises visibility to just how difficult it is to secure a hospital environment. There's so much stuff that is vitally important you know i'm sure somebody at the end of that pneumatic tube absolutely needs that information quickly um and and how challenging it is to keep all of that stuff protected yeah and it's one of those things where there's like a disconnect because it seems like it's the most analog way to like it, it's it seems like it's so physical like so steampunky almost to use pneumatic <laughs> tubes like you don't you don't think your bank pneumatic tube can get hacked, but any system with a you know a controller, I mean, it almost goes back to the to the IoT example. We've certainly seen hospitals have issues with things like connected heart monitors. We've seen pacemakers, you know, kind of be attack surfaces here. I almost think it's going to be like uh, like Battlestar Galactica after a while, where we're gonna like we're we're gonna say like we can hit these certain efficiencies if we network all the things, but the threat to you know the the Cylon cyber attackers, we need to keep all these systems disconnected for that. I, it would be a shame if we can't do that because there obviously there are like real health benefits to doing so. Um, and that's uh, obviously the continual challenge um, and, and why it's not so easy as saying like a, a, a typical convenience versus security kind of mindset, I think. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I'll say it again, at the cybersecurity teams that walk into their hospital CEO and ask for a budget, they're competing with all of the people asking for a new system or a new machine that, you know, they have data that shows that saves human lives. You know, it does something that, you know, 
tangibly can improve um, humans' lives. And so, you know, coming in as a cybersecurity professional, asking for a lot of money for potential issues, is it's a really difficult conversation. Next up here, federal agencies are failing to protect sensitive data, according to a new Senate report. Of eight federal agencies audited for their cybersecurity programs, only the Department of Homeland Security showed improvements in 2020, according to a report from the Senate Homeland Security and Governmental Affairs Committee. Released by the panel uh, earlier this week, the report underscores the increased scrutiny of federal cybersecurity by lawmakers in the aftermath of the SolarWinds supply chain attack. It found that seven of the eight agencies reviewed still use legacy systems that no longer have security up supported by their vendor, which can leave agencies vulnerable to foreign hacking, the report notes. You know, the Biden administration has kind of been open about trying to tighten up security or at least making a lot of noise about it publicly. Doesn't exactly get good grades, though, from this report initially. You know, Sandy, just curious for your overall thoughts on, you know, obviously what's going to be an ongoing story. Well, it's, you know, obviously is extremely disturbing. I mean, it's it showed a lot of issues that they had been ident- had been identified. But the positive is they're looking. You know, they're actually going out and doing due diligence and trying to determine whether or not people are, are making the grade and are implementing the right security um, uh, controls in the right places and following the, and their own published standards. You know, I, I my hope is out of this report, um, it really does drive action. It drives priorities. It, you know, I can almost guarantee at the end of this report, you know, whoever was part of that audit, there was a cybersecurity professional saying, I've been screaming about this for years. You know, I couldn't get anyone to pay attention and care about this. And it's thankful that they were, were audited and now it has visibility. So I think it's positive. I think it's a step in the right direction. And I look forward to, you know, seeing improvements. I mean, my day's in there. I want to make sure they protect it. Yeah, uh, definitely. <laughs> definitely. Uh, next up here, spear phishing attackers increasingly targeting non-C-suite em- C-suite employees. According to a report from Barracuda, an average organization is targeting is targeted by over 700 social engineering attacks each year, and 77% of BEC attacks target employees outside of financial and executive roles, including personnel working in sales, project management, human resources, and administration. Uh, you know, this is definitely different from regular spam. Uh, these non c C-suite, easy for me to say, spear phishing attacks show that middle and lower levels of organizations are now becoming easier targets, just easier to get to, probably with more access uh, than ever. Is this a victory for cybersecurity in that hackers are being forced to go elsewhere from the top level or simply an expansion of a winning model for cyber attackers? Oh, wow. That's a difficult question to answer. Uh, who's, I think you're asking who's winning. I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> or or, is, or is, is this is this kind of the, the, the proof that we constantly need to reevaluate like the value of an employee from like a cyber attack perspective in terms of like, you know, it used to be, okay, you know, the CEO, the CFO, these people have all the information, all the access. We need to put a, you know, a giant fence around them. And is it now that hey, we need to, you know, we need to kind of anticipate that these lower levels may get breached and kind of, you know, uh, segment those as well uh, and not just kind of have um, an all or nothing for the C-suite kind of approach. You know, I, I, I'll even go bigger. And we obviously, we, I run all sorts of reports. I look at who's the most targeted. I try to understand why. But, you know, it may be time to have two email addresses for every employee, one that you, you share out when you sign up for a conference and one that you share externally, one you share internally so that we reduce our attack surface and control it that way. I mean, I I I think we're at a point where just do the same thing isn't really working. I mean, it, it it is a loop of insanity. If I have to go, if I want to go look at a phishing report published by a major vendor, I they typically ask for my email address, my phone number, you know, to send me more email. I mean, we're in this insane loop of, of using these email addresses. So I think there's a lot of, of I mean, it's interesting that, you know, it clearly shows we've we've taught our CFOs and our CEOs to be really cautious and we need to expand that conversation. But I also think it's it's a flag that, hey, maybe the, the email thing, maybe this isn't working well and we have to rethink how we do it. 
All right. And our final story of the day, ransomware operators are recruiting insiders to breach corporate networks. Lockbit 2.0 ransomware operators are actively recruiting insiders to breach networks. This effectively cuts out the middleman for many ransomware as a service schemes, which typically use affiliates to breach networks for a share of the ransom. Blippin Computer believes these messages are targeted at external IT consultants who work for multiple clients presumably not for long if they're uh, <laughs> working with ransomware operators, hopefully. Uh, you know, a lot of insider threat has kind of been a big buzzword in this in the security community as of late, uh, trying to develop better tools uh, to kind of deal with that threat. Um, does, I mean, is, is this surprising to you, Sandy, to see ransomware being this blatant, I guess? I, that was what was surprising to me. They were replacing wallpapers with like advertising recruitments. <laughs> Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think we can always look to the attacker community for their creativity. I mean, you know, that, you know, the business model keeps, you know, impressing the rest of us with how, you know, how, how the agile and, and willing to um, look for new ways to, to run their business. Um, but it definitely, I, insider threat, I mean, Snowden, I mean, we can come up with all sorts of examples. It's a CISO's worst nightmare, you know, I, you know, trust. But when you think about it, who should I trust is a human problem. I mean, that's that's been a problem ever since, you know, Caesar got stabbed. I mean, <laughs> you know, trust is a really complex thing to understand because, you know, to do anything, we have to trust, you know, and, and trying to figure out, you know, um, Philby, when, you know, when he was part of, of um, uh, GCH, I think, was the right spy agency in Britain. Mm -hmm. You know, he was such a, a, a destructive force within the British spy agency. And here he had so much trust. So, yeah, it's a complex problem. Does it, you know, yes, everything worries me. I guess that's the short answer. Everything I'm worried about. The truest me. CISO response uh, we could ever receive here, <laughs> Sandy. Thank yeah. you so much. Before we get you out of here, though, what was uh, one story that kind of stood out for you today? Maybe either good or bad, thumbs up, thumbs down, uh, give an eye roll. Uh, what was what was it for you, Sandy? You know, for me, it was the Pegasus story. I really think that that, that story um, raises the visibility to, um, you know, people selling software that potentially can cause um, you know, far reaching damage to our societies. And I really want to recognize the work by the, the Pegasus team that investigated that and also Citizens Lab and EFF. You know, Citizens Labs and EFF over the last couple of decades have been so um, dedicated to making sure that our privacy and in our rights on a global level have been protected. And you know, really, I donate to them. I encourage everyone to. Uh, they do great work. Well, thank you so much, Sandy Dunn, for being on the show. Uh, Sandy Dunn, the CISO Blue Cross of Idaho. Thank you again, again. We'll have to have you on uh, real soon. And also, thank you to our sponsor, PlexTrack, for supporting the show. Remember, cybersecurity headlines is available every day. If you got about six minutes, you can stay up to date on all the latest. And you can come back next week. We've got all sorts of great live video coming up next Friday. Our video chat, Hacking Cloud Infrastructure, starts at 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern. Uh, this coming Coming up Friday, a week from today, followed by speed dating. And then we'll be back with yet another edition of the Week in Review Friday at 12.30 p.m. East, or 12.30 p.m. Pacific, 3.30 Eastern. Until then, I'm Rich Straffolino. Have a super sparkly day. Cybersecurity headlines are available every weekday. Head to CISOseries.com for the full stories behind the headlines.